Welcome, welcome all you lunchtime learners, stewards, as well as guests that we have this week. Happy to see everyone. Um, really eager to hear today's presentation, but before we get started, I have just a couple of announcements. So in case you haven't heard, the big news is that Pathfinders are now more appropriately named Trailhead Ambassadors. Hooray! <laughs> um, and while our in-person kind of programming is ending, there are a couple of virtual opportunities that are going to still be, be available on Wednesday, May 25th. Parsons Field Institute Symposium from 1 to 4.30. Uh, learn about the year of mm. conservation, <laughs> successes, impactful research findings. Um, you can sign up on, and find the link on Better Impact. Our next Lunch and Learn is Thursday, May 12th at noon, of course, uh, where Kathy Anderson is going to be talking about birds of the preserve. Um, I don't know about you guys. I always interested in the birds that I'm seeing and hearing, but I don't have a lot of patience for standing around with binoculars, so I'm really glad for this opportunity. Um, before we get started, uh, in case you have questions while the speakers are doing their presentation, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get, the, uh, get to them as soon as we can. So I have to say, honestly, when I hear the word bats, most of the time I go, ew, but I think after today's presentation, I'll have a whole kind of different viewpoint. So today presenting for us is Debbie Lagenfeld and Jesse Dwyer. Debbie's been a steward since 2015, has been involved in many citizen science projects. She's held several leadership positions within that program, as well as being the citizen science chair for three years. She's currently lead for the Bat Research Project. Thank you so much for everything you do, Debbie. Jesse Dwyer is currently the science coordinator at the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy, primarily working on the Conservancy's long-term biodiversity monitoring projects. She recently graduated from ASU with a master's in applied biological sciences. For her graduate research project, she was involved in evaluating the effect of urbanization on bats in the Phoenix area using acoustic bat monitors. So thank you wow. both for being here and for all of the work that you do. And why don't you take it away, Debbie? Okay. There we go. Well, thank you, Max, for that nice introduction. And hello, everybody. I wanted to take a short, uh, quick shout out to Marianne Moore, who has been our, our research partner from the very beginning of this project. She couldn't be with us today, but she's been instrumental in providing the knowledge and uh, information and support we need to achieve our joint goals. Now I'm going to do a little adjusting here. The bat and butterfly research fits into one of the Parsons Field Institute's top priorities to assess the um, impact of, uh, is it showing actually? Oh, it is, sorry. To assess the impact of urbanization and climate change on the preserve and Sonoran Desert. In order to do that, we have to monitor for long periods of time. And long really does mean long, ideally 10 plus years. That requires quite a bit of patience and it can be frustrating for those of us like me who want to get a quick answer. But using anything shorter than that and um, wrong conclusions might be drawn. You'll see an example of this when Doug and Ron show how the weather patterns for the past few years has affected the butterfly survey results. So threats. Well, why are, I'm sorry, I think that's not the slide. Important, sorry. Bats play essential roles in the ecosystems around the world. Oh, you know, I have something wrong with my presentation. Okay, take take a moment. I mean, right now I'm we're- not sure I can figure it out. Uh, we're seeing long-term uh, Yeah, but you're not, you're seeing, seeing important. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. 
Okay. Oh, why are so why are we studying bats? Well, bats are crucial to the health of our planet. Most of Arizona's 28 species of bats are insectivores. They're a natural pesticide consuming tons of mosquitoes. And I say thank you for that, bats. Another insect saving farmers and communities millions of dollars each year. The nectarboreous bats pollinate plants such as floral and agave, and we have the Mexican long-tongued and lesser long-nosed bats that fly that migrate up through uh, southern Arizona in the summer for tequila and other delicious margar and, and our delicious margaritas. Uh, there aren't any frugivores in uh, Arizona. They tend to like more tropical kinds of habitats, but they eat fruit and disperse seeds for new plants and trees to grow. So unfortunately, there are a lot of threats to, just like a lot of other species, to bats. And we're, they're in serious decline around the world. And some of those threats include loss of habitat, noise pollution, light pollution, and intentional disturbance by humans. But the overarching reason is that urbanization is urbanization, human disturbance that really affects bats. And you might be familiar with the Mexican free tail bats. They kind of adapt pretty well to, hu to humans. The, they use the Maricopa Cup flood control tunnels in Phoenix as roofs in the summer. But other bats um, don't do so well. So places like the reserve, they're quiet at night and that um, don't have any artificial lighting uh, are good places for them to hang out and uh, find refuge. But of course, then we also have a lot of development going around and urbanization already in place at the preserve and a lot of development going around, uh, uh, going on right now in the preserve. And if that really isn't enough, then we have, um, this fungus infection uh, known as white nose syndrome that affects hibernating bats and has killed millions of them in the Eastern US, it's really sad. Um, and they're moving west and have been detected in California, Texas and New Mexico. So it's probably really inevitable that they will uh, eventually get detected in Arizona as well. So in order to achieve our goals uh, of assessing the effects of urbanization and climate change, we have to combine methods. Since 2019 then, we've been doing emergence counts and acoustic surveys in an area that preserve that is known to support bats. The combination of the two methods then provides information on relatively how many bats are there, when they're there, and what species are there. We've also done captures in the past, but for this Lunch and Learn, we're going to focus on emergence and acoustics. In 2001, we received um, some funding as part of a heritage grant that allowed us to purchase equipment and expand our research to include working with USGS's um, North American Bat Monitoring Program. And so that funding allows us to do more acoustic uh, recordings across different areas of the preserve. So uh, a little more about the bat research and emergence counts. There are several closed mines in the preserve and we're monitoring one that's known to support bat population. It's a great place for them because it has consistent temperatures uh, uh, and humidity that the bats prefer. And there's also water uh, for the bats. And the surrounding riparian area offers really a green place for foraging and commuting. We did some preliminary research between 2016 and 2019 at this mine, um, captures and counts where we borrowed some equipment. But in May of 2019, we started rigorously doing surveys once a month, close to the new moon or darkest night of the month when the bats are most active. So an emergence count is a standard method of doing bat research in roofs. We are using the Game and Fishes protocol so that we will be able to compare our results from theirs when they do emergence counts at other mines. So what do we do? Well, we position two infrared lights 
two video cameras and two acoustic recorders at the mine, turn on the equipment for 30 minutes before sunset and continue to record bad activity for 2.5 hours. To ensure consistent results across months, we measure the position of each piece of equipment. We want to make sure that it's located when we do the counts and, and pretty close to the same spot. So we measure how far and what angle they are from the mine, the height from the ground, and the height from the ground. And so you might ask, well, why do we do two of everything? Well, certainly a safeguard in case something goes wrong. Believe me, I've had things go wrong. Uh, and also it gives us two different views and data points of the emerging bats. Um, the acoustic data is processed by a special software that's designed to identify bat species by their calls. Jessie will talk more about that when she takes over the presentation. The videos are manually reviewed to determine the number of bats coming out of the mine and going into the mine. With nearly three years of data, that means that fellow citizen scientists John Griffin and I have reviewed over 250 hours of video. And I'm really happy to say now that I actually have four more people who are gonna help review the videos. That'll be great. We also hope that at some point um, this, uh, this process can be automated. We have two students, uh, four students right now actually at ASU who are just finishing working on a class project where they want to, or working on automating this process for us. So it won't be done when they, uh, at the end of their project, but we're hoping that somebody else will pick up that project because that would be really cool to um, be able to have that process automated. So it's a little bit difficult, to, I think, probably to see uh, what to sh see what uh, John and I are reviewing. So I thought I'd uh, add this little video to the presentation. And so watch closely and you'll see a bat entering the mine. And that's, a, we count that as a one in. And so if you keep watching, you'll see a bat exiting the mine and we count that as a one out. Now you might say, say that that was the same bat. You might say, Debbie, you're crazy. That was the same bat and we're double counting. But do you really know for sure that that was the same bat? Um, <clears throat> that's why we're calling what we do not, not um, absolute abundance, but relative abundance, because we could be observing the same bat in and out, or it could be different bats. Our highest count was uh, 84 outs, and that was in May of 2019. It was right when we started doing this rigor rigorous emergence counts. Um, and we're still seeing that same maximum number of bats out, uh, from when we started in 2019. So that's really, really good. Um, it, and it, it, it really gets interesting reviewing these videos when there's 84 bats coming out. So our findings. Well, we know uh, that there's been bats there at least since 2018 when BLM and uh, Arizona Game and Fish periodically conducted uh, emergent counts and captures at the site. In 1992, they determined the bat is used as a maternity, the mine, I'm sorry, <laughs> is used as a maternity roost for Thompson bigger bats. In 2018, Game and Fish went into the mine and visually identified the Townsend's presence. And we confirmed by having a DNA sample tested of the feces that they collected that there were Townsend bigger bats in the mine and using the mine. And we were also thrilled to find during a capture in 2019 that the bats were still using it. And that was an important find because the Townsends are very, very sensitive to roost disturbance and have specialized roost requirements for temperature. That's kind of a big deal for us. It's very rare to find Townsend maternity roost to study. And so we're fortunate to have this opportunity right in our own backyard to better understand their habitat requirements. We're also starting to see patterns in the data that indicate the bats are present in the area year round. 
especially during late spring and early summer. Uh, this makes sense because that's when the temperatures are warming, the hibernating bats are returning, the females have their babies, and that's when there are plenty of invertebrates to eat. One very preliminary result, and preliminary uh, hot off the press actually as of yesterday, uh, indicates that the bat activity seems to not only be related to seasonality, but also to temperature. By that we mean it's it seems like the Thames and big eared bats are not emerging from the roost in cases of extreme cold or hot temperatures. For the acoustic bats, we most often see them flying uh, around uh, in, the, in the wash and in the riparian area. They're probably using that area for foraging or uh, for commuting as well. So now I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Jesse, who will um, talk about uh, a lot more about the, our partnership with the North America Bat Monitoring Program and how we're helping them meet their goals and uh, acoustic monitoring. We'll talk quite a bit about acoustic monitoring and uh, discuss some further results. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, so um, in addition to the emergence counts we're doing at the old mine, we also conduct these annual acoustic surveys, um, which is part of our long-term monitoring efforts and also in partnership with, with NABAT. Um, and so acoustic monitoring is a passive um, survey technique where we're recording the echolocation calls of bats. And then we run those sound files through uh, software. And, it, and then we're able to visually look at the calls and each bat has a different set of call characteristics and we can use those to identify uh, to the species level, which is really exciting. And we'll look at one of those sound files uh, in a minute here. So the um, North American Bat Monitoring Program or NABAT is this international um, program um, designed to monitor bat abundance and distributions um, at a, a bunch of different scales. So they'll look um, at states, regional, cross country, international. And the idea is to, um, provide natural resource managers with um, the data necessary to understand how these populations um, are surviving, if they are stable, if they're declining, and if so, you know, why and where. Um, and, and that allows us to detect these kind of early warning signs of population decline and, and, and potential extinction risk. So it's, it's super important. And we wanted, you know, our, um, we, we wanted to monitor our bot, bat populations long-term, um, to keep an eye on our populations. We also wanna to add to this larger um, network of information on bats. And so we can maybe understand um, how these populations are, are faring regionally too. Um, so it's really important to kind of connect with our partners in that way. Um, and that helps us better understand uh, our bats in the area. And so any bat has these grid cells um, uh, across the areas that they survey with priority uh, habitat for bats. And we have a grid cell um, where our sites are, are located an any bat grid cell. And so we have five sites um, within that any bat grid cell. And um, so we first, before we did the official um, survey, we wanted to do a pilot study. And this is actually how um, I got connected to the Conservancy, which is really fun. So um, as Max mentioned, um, I did my graduate research uh, at ASU and I used some acoustic monitoring to um, survey the bats in the Phoenix area. And so, um, the Conservancy asked me to do a pilot study, which I was very happy to do. And so we kind of just set up at the sites what we were thinking about using, um, monitored those bats uh, for that pilot study. And then we went ahead and did our first official um, long-term monitoring uh, survey in 2021 um, and gave those, those data to any bat, which is really exciting. And so for our annual acoustic surveys, we do uh, two week surveys in May um, from sunset to sunrise and, um, Let's see, you can go to the next slide, Debbie. And yeah, so this is the um, data that we get with those acoustic surveys. So this is a Sonabat, this is a software where we can put our sound files in and it displays it for us here in the spectrogram. And um, each call, um, each bat will have different call characteristics such as uh, the frequency that the call is at, the duration of the call, uh, the shape of the call, the number of pulses within a certain amount of time. This is our Yuma, our Yuma Myotis uh, bat call. And this is a um, commuter call is what we call it, where the bat's kind of just flying around and navigating. So there's nice uniform pulses. It's a lot easier to identify than some other calls such as their social calls or their feeding calls. 
Okay. And so um, for our pilot study in 2019, we detected 12 species in the preserve, uh, which was very exciting. And then um, for our 2021 uh, official uh, survey, we uh, detected 10 species. And what's great about that is we actually, for the first time, detected the UMIOTIS. And so we added this additional species to our flora and fauna list at the preserve. And this is, um, Debbie mentioned, having multiple survey um, techniques, uh, which is great because if we didn't have um, these acoustic surveys, we may not detect this UMIOTIS, so it's awesome. Um, and so then, for the rest of the bats, we detected the canyon bat and the Mexican pretail bat the most, which is um, not surprising. That was also the case for my um, for my study across Phoenix. They are everywhere. Those are the two most uh, frequently detected bats. And so overall, with all of the bat monitoring work that we do at the preserve, uh, the emergency counts, the acoustic surveys, um, some previous work we did that Debbie mentioned with the captures, Overall, with our bat monitoring efforts, we have so far detected 13 species in the preserve, which is amazing. Um, and we have that sensitive species, the Townsend figure bat, and that new species, the Eumyotis, that are a highlight. And then here, I just put a, uh, we just put a star next to um, the bats that may be sensitive to urbanization. So this is something that I found with my graduate research. These bats um, were avoiding urbanized areas. And so um, we kind of uh, have these these at least additional five species beyond the, the Townsend bigger bat um, that are potentially um, impacted uh, by humans, by urban uh, development and increasing human presence. So this kind of highlights the importance of our long-term monitoring efforts here, where we have these um, groups of um, these bat populations um, that may be um, negatively impacted as urbanization continues to develop um, around the preserve, as we get higher human population, build more trails, all those kinds of things. So it's really important for us to establish a baseline of the population levels for these species and keep an eye on them. And, and that way we can kind of, um, if there's any sort of population declines, we can relate it to some sort of um, cause hopefully, and that will help us uh, manage our populations. And then like Debbie mentioned uh, before, we have our, our, our Townsend figure bat, which it seems like temperature might be affecting the species. Um, and so we definitely wanna continue monitoring the species for a very, very long time um, because if temperature influences species, then as the climate changes, we might see um, some declines in this population. So we wanna keep an eye on them. And so what's next for our bat project? So Debbie mentioned some of our preliminary results for our emergence counts. Um, and we actually, um, our research partner, Marianne Moore, will be discussing those results in detail. Um, on May 25th at our um, annual Field Institute Symposium um, from 1 to 4.30. So if you could tune into that, if you're interested in um, the results from our emergence counts from those um, three years uh, of data, as well as our other projects um, in the Field Institute, um, please join us for that if you'd like. We're also going to continue our emergence counts at the old mine, as well as our annual acoustic survey. So like we're talking about, um, we wanna do these long-term studies. So five, 10, 20 years, forever, if, they, if they'd let us. Um, and so we're gonna continue doing that, continue monitoring our populations, get a baseline of what our um, bat populations are doing from year to year, establish trends, and try to relate it to any, um, any sort of variables that might be impacting um, these bats, um, such as urbanization, human disturbance, and um, climate change, like we've been mentioning. And then we can also use this information to inform management decisions. So for example, if we find a maternity risk like we do have for the Townsend's bigger bat, you know, we can limit access to the area. Uh, this bat um, is really, really sensitive to, to human disturbance and will abandon its roost. So um, those are kind of steps we can take to um, help better preserve that population. Another thing, um, the, the bats that we had stars next to, um, sensitive to urbanization and factors of urbanization, such as artificial lighting. So if there's any sort of initiative where they want to put lights around the preserve for some reason, uh, we could definitely um, step in and ask them not to do that, for example, because uh, we have some bats that might be sensitive to that. So there's just um, little things we can do um, to help mitigate those changes um, as, as time goes on. And then, uh, of course, a huge special thank you to our partners, um, all of the staff, all of the stewards that have put hard work into um, this project, especially Debbie, just the hours and hours of uh, video review and <laughs> working on equipment issues. Um, but it's just such an incredible project and I, and I just can't wait to see what um, we do with it as it goes further, so. Okay, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, you can take down the presentation now if you want to, and then we're gonna just kind of ask, uh, does anybody have any questions for Jesse or Debbie? 
Okay, see, so you covered the material so well. <laughs> That right now there are no questions, but I certainly have a new appreciation for for bats, um, and I understand now that they are our friends. So yes. thank you so much. They for are. They yeah. love those mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah, which we don't. So <laughs> yeah, which we don't. <laughs> I did get a uh, a question about white nose um, syndrome, so I can talk about that for for a second here. So, sure. um. Sure. Uh, I think I got it directly instead of uh, generally to the chat. So the question was, is white nose disease impacting all bats in other states, certain bat species, you know, what percent are dying, that kind of thing. So white nose syndrome um, is kind of a, like Debbie mentioned, like a fungus. And so it basically makes the bats super uncomfortable and they'll wake up during hibernation and they will um, use their energy reserves. And that's why it affects their population so badly. So um, the bats that are most impacted by this are bats that, uh, roost together in very close contact. Um, and so they'll spread it really um, easily between them. Um, and also, of course, the fungus does fine in, in cold temperatures. So there's, um, so that's why um, over the east, it, it's, it's really doing um, well, unfortunately. And we thought maybe um, in Arizona where it's like dry and hotter, maybe we won't have an issue, but I, I have a feeling it's going to be an issue here uh, soon and, and inevitably. Um, maybe, but yeah, so be, maybe up north or something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. something where um, we're going to be monitoring our bot populations to make sure that's not going on. If it does go on, um, you know, we can take steps to mitigate that. But so anytime anybody does any captures, we're being super careful not to transfer <laughs> diseases between bats and things like that. So, yeah, definitely a huge problem. And it's uh, um, invasive from um, Europe. That's where it came from. Right. Europe oh, thank States. you so much. Now the now the questions are coming. Okay. In. Ooh, yeah, hey, they are. Yeah, There's so a lot curious. of it does say for you about your research and thing. Oh. Um, Andrea wants to know, do we see bats um, at all in the winter? Yes, we do have year-round species. Um, Debbie mentioned we do have yep, um, we evidence see. of bats. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, not as many. We, we At the mine, we have not seen the numbers go down in the winter. Um, oh, interesting. You know, our, our counts will be very low, like five sometimes. Um, but And then they shoot up, you know, when they start bat arriving bat. But not as many. But, yeah, we do see some bats. And it depends on the species. So like the canyon bat, Mexican pre tail bat, they'll be here all year. Um, and certain populations will move around. Um, but yeah, it depends on the species, but we do have them all year, yeah. Interesting. So um, Barbara had a good question. What can mm. we do in our neighborhoods to protect and be sure we're not harming bats? Great question. Um, if anybody would like to build some houses for bats, we have some bat boxes you can get. Um, really? There's a couple companies that do that. You can just get it right shipped to you, uh, put it up, and that'll um, increase the number of roosting sites for bats. Um, if you have any um, artificial lighting that you can turn off, that would be great. If you have control over it, I know a lot of us don't, they're um, on the light posts and things like that. Um, let's see. If you, we don't have any um, nectar feeders here, but uh, if, if you do have, um, if we do have nectar feeders, if anybody's down south in southern Arizona, you could put some hummingbird feeders up and they will take a drink out of that. They'll, they'll <laughs> drain them every night, <laughs> yeah. every single night. They go on yeah. the hummingbird watch, I mean, watch out for the bats every night. I've got pictures of them draining. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Karen wants to know, is there a bat that you'd expect to see, but you haven't seen? That's a great question. There is one, um, the California leaf nose bat, um, I know is here. Um, and I did not detect it during my graduate research and we have not detected it at the preserve. Um, so that would be one that I would like to see for sure. And they're a little bit difficult to detect acoustically um, because they, um, they can kind of see a little bit better than other bats. So they don't necessarily use their um, acoustic um, calls as much as other bats do, but they're a little bit quieter. So some, you know, some bats are a little bit harder to detect, but I would love to see that bat if we could. All right, let's, let's hope. Um, Marcia, Marcia wants to know, do any of the bats in this area, area pollinate the saguaro like they do in Tucson? Oh, I love this question. So um, you would think, so we don't have pollinator um, bats up this far, but the pallet bat has been known to pollinate um, saguaro cactuses. Um, it, it is not built like a, a, um, a pollinator bat, so it doesn't have the long nose and the long tongue, but it actually makes it a better pollinator sometimes um, because it just kind of gets all over the bats and then it actually ends up being a little bit better of a pollinator. And that bat is really, really cool because that bat also eats scorpions and centipedes and things like that. So that's probably one of the coolest uh, uh, Arizona desert bats, quintessential desert bat species. Um, so if you, if you want to look up the palabat, they're very cute. They have little pig noses. 
um, big fat advocate, advocate over here. <laughs> They're cute, I promise. <laughs> okay, so uh, Esty wants to know, what's the lifespan of a bat? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, it depends on the species. Um, I would have to say, I would have to look that one up because I don't want to say the wrong number. Okay. Um, so we're going to leave that to Google. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. So Tiffany um, gave us some more information here and she's the Mexican long tongue bat is expanding its range. Um, have any of it made it to Phoenix yet? Um, they've been found in, uh, what did she say? Boyce Thompson mm -hmm. Arboretum to the east, but have we seen them here in the Phoenix area? I've not seen them in any of the data from the acoustic monitoring uh, that I've done for the monitors yet. Um, we didn't see them for any bad stuff, and we did. Oh, I, I have not seen them in the mine areas either so okay. far. And, and, and I, I'm sorry, Jesse, go ahead. I was just going to say, I wanted to answer Barbara's question there. Please. Um, so from the, the little research that they've done, it's mostly the harsh white lights um, is my understanding that are more harmful to bats. And actually, um, and I don't know the specific light that you use, but um, actually the red lighting um, is I believe less harmful. Um, but there's there needs to be more research done on, on how light lighting specifically affects bats. Um, so more more research to come, but I believe the, the white lights are, are much harsher and more harmful. All right, well, we're going to make this one the last question because okay. we want to move on to our second presentation. And Robin wants to know, what do we do if we see a dead bat in the preserve while we're out there? That's a great question. Um, well, and we've, we've actually seen one. We have mm -hmm. seen one actually in the preserve. And we left yeah. it. Uh, we saw it. Uh, uh, Stewart saw it but when I went back to try to find it, something. It had carried it off. So. Okay. Uh, we left it still there. <laughs> no, I don't know, Jesse, what your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, that's a great question. We've actually talked about um, a general protocol for what to do when you see um, a dead animal. So we might um, we might have something coming soon um, about to do's and not to do's. Um, you do wanna be careful. Um, most bats don't carry rabies, but some do. So I would be careful handling anything. Um, and I will get back to you on a specific to do who to call because um, I don't wanna give you the wrong information. Um, so TBD there. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. All right, um, let's go on to the second portion of our presentation, butterflies. And so Doug Jensen is a lead steward who joined the Conservancy in 2015. He is assistant chair of citizen science program and project lead for the butterfly survey project. He has also been involved intensely in the non-native plant research and eradication in the preserve. Ron Rutowski is Professor Emeritus, School of Life Sciences, ASU. He's taught, lectured, and published in numerous forums, both nationally and internationally. He's the editor of the Journal on Animal Behavior and president of the Central Arizona Butterfly Association, as well as a member of the PFI Scientific Advisory Committee. And if Ron would be so gracious, I would love to know what the PFI Scientific Advisory Committee is because I wasn't able to find anything on it. So welcome to Ron and Doug. Hey, thanks, Max. Uh, the Scientific Advisory Committee has, uh, wait, let me just make sure I've got this right here. How does that look? Looks good. Looks good to me. Okay, let me just make one other change here. I'm going to, uh, can you see my laser pointer? Yes, we can. Good, I'll be using that. Uh, the Scientific Advisory Committee is a group of people with scientific expertise, expertise on various taxa within the, uh, the uh, yeah, various tax that occur within the preserve. And uh, we haven't met uh, all that much very recently, but it's to provide the, uh, the Field Institute with uh, broad scale scientific advice on the various monitoring programs and scientific activities that are going on on the preserve. So um, yeah, yeah, I, that's about all I can say about it. Well, thank you very much for clarifying. Yeah. It's great. 
thank, uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I'm going to be reviewing or updating you on the butterfly monitoring program. And I'll just preface my remarks by saying that I think one of the things you're going to see are some, as you hear about bat monitoring, butterfly monitoring, bird monitoring, and then at your next meeting, is that there are pretty some, some pretty striking differences between how the monitoring programs are structured that reflect really uh, the differences in the natural history and the biology of the organisms that are being studied, but are all providing data that's really important to the preserve uh, and beyond. So in what I'm going to do today, I'm gonna, uh, th this is a brief outline. Uh, Doug Jensen will be chiming in in a few minutes, but I'm gonna say first a few general comments about why we do butterfly counts um, both uh, on a broad scale as well as more locally. I'm going to talk about the North American Butterfly Association count program, which we submit our data to. Uh, and then I'm also going to be talking about butterfly monitoring, the details of butterfly monitoring on the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. Doug will chime in on that. And uh, then I'm going to, and also about count procedures and the, the, the plans that we have going forward. And then uh, I'm going to use the spring count that was just done uh, a month or so uh, earlier this month, actually, to talk about, uh, to, to sort of illustrate the kinds of results we get from a count, as well as some of the ways it's contributing to our more long-term understanding of what's going on with butterflies on the preserve. So we monitor butterfly populations we, for, for a number of reasons. Is one gonna ask why butterflies specifically? Well, butterflies are generally regarded as good indicator of the effects of environmental, the effects of environmental health and change. Um, so this is a, in large measure because of their close association with the plant community. The larvae of butterflies, the caterpillars, as I'm sure you all know, feed on plants. And so their success Survival and survival is very much dependent on the, the what foods available, the numbers of them that are supported is dependent on how many of the plants that they need are available. The adults also re rely on plants for nectar resources. Um, adults don't really feed on pollen. They do some pollination, but they visit plants to get sugar water in the form of nectar, which is really critical to enhancing their survival and reproduction. So there are ways in which butterflies are good indicators of the overall health and well-being of the plant community. Also, butterflies are what we call behavioral thermoregulators. Their, uh, and their body temperature is very much a function of what the environmental temperature is, how much solar radiation there is, how much wind there is. And so as the environment is, uh, it changes, uh, this might affect their what behaviors they can perform, um, and in particular as the temperature changes. And so again, their 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 populations are good indicators of of how healthy the environment is and what changes are occurring. Also, butterflies are big, charismatic, and they fly during the day, so they're easy to observe and to count. So it's not difficult really to, to sort of work out procedures for uh, programs to monitor their butterfly, their populations. And the fact that they're charismatic, charismatic and beautiful makes it easy to recruit people to help. People love butterflies. And uh, also another thing that is handy is that butterfly classification is relatively well known. There are debates as you'll learn, as, as we've learned and others know about um, about some species identifications, but there are many field guides available both online and in books. And there are also many experienced butterfly watchers even in the Valley who can help out with these counts and help us get the identifications that need to be done in the course of a count, uh, get them done properly. So these are some of the reasons why fo we focus on butterflies in particular. And uh, there, this, this article sort of makes it clear as well uh, how we can use the data from counts such as this in a much broader scheme. This is a paper that appeared in the journal Science uh, last year, about a, just about a year ago. It was, it was a study that was based on data that were collected by programs such as our butterfly monitoring count program on the preserve. 
they gathered it from all of these sorts of data from all over the Western United States and analyzed them and found that there were some pretty uh, disturbing uh, changes in butterfly populations over the, the over many years. Some of these data sets go back 30 or 40 years. Our don't, ours don't at this point, so we really didn't get added into this study, but uh, these sorts of, we would hope that our data would be of value in such studies, broad scale studies going forward. And they found a 1.6% annual reduction in the number of individual butterflies observed over the past four decades, uh, particularly associated with warming during the fall months. So it's, uh, these are the kinds of uh, studies of broad, how broad scale environmental changes are affecting uh, populations of organisms such as butterflies to which we hope our counts uh, on the preserve can contribute in the future as we get more and more data. I also want to just say that locally we monitor butterfly populations for what I see as two main reasons. One is to guide decisions about how to manage resources on the preserve. We don't really have, as you'll see, we don't really know exactly what the trends are in the preserve at this point, but going forward in the future, um, the data that we get from monitoring butterfly populations can contribute to, dis to management decisions. I also think that it's important in terms of providing material for environmental education programs and the conservancy. People love to hear about butterflies, love to learn about their biology, love to learn about their natural history, just as they do with the bats and the birds and the other taxa that we are studying. Uh, on the preserve. And so this stuff really becomes an important, uh, these sorts of monitoring programs become an important educational resource in my view. Now, our counts on the preserve are, are modeled, or well, we use the guidelines that have been established by the North American Butterfly uh, Association Butterfly Count Programs. This is a program that's been going on since 1975. They maintain a database uh, uh, for counts that are done all over the United States and even into Canada and Mexico. And at this point, there's something in excess of 450 count sites that have been established. And uh, ours, this, uh, was, this was from, well, I forget what year this was from exactly, but uh, I think uh, this spot right here where I've got my laser pointer is actually the McDowell Sonoran Preserve uh, count site. So the North American Butterfly Association count program has a specific set of guidelines that we follow. And first is that uh, we're counting only adult butterflies. This, this program and the program within the preserve focuses on the adults. If we see caterpillars and chrysalises in the course of the count, we certainly pay attention to them and are interested in them, but we're not actively counting them. So again, this it just illustrates, we're talking about an organism with a complex life cycle with these distinct stages, but these count programs, because the adult butterflies are big and conspicuous, are really focused on, on the adults. For the McDowell Sonoran Preserve count, uh, as the North American Butterfly Association suggests one should do, we've established a 15 mile count circle, which is centered in the, the latitude and longitude it's given there, but it is centered uh, somewhere near the Tom Thumb trailhead. And we survey a series of six, eight areas uh, within that uh, 15 mile count center or circle. So here is the count circle uh, and, it, and, and you can see the areas that are involved. It goes almost pretty much all the way over to the Verde River, although we don't really count over there. And it extends even into some of the urban areas along the, the uh, eastern edge of Scottsdale here. But all of our count sites are, are well embedded within the preserve. And then, and you can see them here, uh, Browns Ranch Trailhead. There's also, we've, we've now divided that into two, a Browns Ranch Road and a Browns Ranch Peak. 
uh, count site. We visit the 128th Street tank. There's uh, uh, Tom's Thumb trailhead uh, count, which goes up Tom's Thumb Canyon, Marcus Landslide, uh, and then also the Dixie Mine. These are the places we sample. And here they are showing their location again. We also do old paint wash, which wasn't shown in that last one, but is included amongst the sites that we, we survey. Um, Doug, I'll invite you to speak at this point about the, uh, the, how, the teams are made, how the teams are made up and what the count methods are. All right, thank you, Ron. I'll be happy to provide some info there. As Ron indicated, the data we collect is very important and we're extremely concerned that it be as reliable as possible. It all starts with the six teams of volunteers who fan out in the preserve twice a year to conduct the counts. Each team is led by an expert naturalist who is familiar with butterfly species in this area. Those experts typically are employed in higher education institutions in this area at the Desert Botanical Garden and at the Arizona Department of Game and Fish. Working as the right hand of the expert on each, each team is the data recorder. In addition to that, we have for each team a steward lead who is trained to handle the many logistical issues involved in account so that the expert, the data recorder, and the other members of the team can move ahead with the counting and, and be free of other logistical concerns. So the steward leads are, are doing things such as explaining the protocol at the beginning of the count, uh, having people sign in for the count, uh, being available to make sure that the, that the team is proceeding along the correct route and so on. We're very concerned about training each person who participates on a butterfly count in the preserve will be attending a workshop prior to the count. Those workshops are conducted by Ron Rutowski and they are going to cover butterfly biology, past data from previous counts, identifying butterflies and the protocol that we use in our counts in the preserve. In addition, the leads of the recorders attend a briefing a couple of days prior to the count to take care of any last minute details and to review the protocol. So let's talk about that protocol. Ron mentioned that the North American Butterfly Association conducts hundreds of counts around the country, but in the preserve, we have protocol that is actually more stringent than that typically used by NABA. We try to control as many variables as possible. So for example, we limit our teams to four to six counters. We cover very precise routes that have been plotted out by Ron throughout the preserve. We always monitor at particular specific days of the year. So that's typically, in fact, not typically, it's always the first Saturday in April and the last Saturday in September. We never begin counting until the temperature is at least 70 degrees. And we're very careful to record various environmental factors such as precipitation and temperature and wind speed. Immediately following each count, Ron Rutowski, our science partner, will meet with the experts from each team and collect the data that they have recorded and discuss that data with them because there are always many questions about properly identifying species. And you can imagine with the typical count covering hundreds of different individuals, there could be many issues to clear up. And in addition to that, the Parsons Field Institute Biodiversity Manager works very closely with Ron in this process to make sure that all of this data is complete and reliable. At this point, I really want to thank all those who participate in our counts. We have a wonderful, reliable group of experts and data recorders and steward leads that we can, upon whom we can depend. And Ron is a, a wonderful combination of expertise and enthusiasm, was really the, the spirit and the driving force behind this count, this count from its inception. So thank you, and I'll turn the time back over to Ron. 
Uh, thanks, Doug. Thanks for those nice words. Yeah, it, 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 this is a, a, a labor intensive project uh, or program that uh, on a given any given count, we have we probably have as many as uh, 45 to 50 people uh, engaged in helping us uh, do these uh, do these counts and monitor the butterflies. And I have to say, too, it's been great working with the preserve. I know in particular our efforts to bring great uh, rigor to as much rigor as we can to the count techniques we use has really been uh, driven hard by Tiffany, Tiffany Sprague. And it's just been great working with her on that. Uh, let me see, where am I here? Yeah, here we go. So just to give you an idea, this is what, after we get all these tally sheets from the teams and put them to, and, and the, the data all gets summarized in a spreadsheet like this. And this is just to give you an idea of what a, a more or less typical count looks like. This is one that was done April 2nd this year. And as you can see, we, we counted the, between the, the, the six teams, we counted over uh, 1,300 individual butterflies. The vast majority, but not all of those were identified to species. So we do have some unidentified individuals. You can see our tally down there toward the bottom of the spreadsheet. But in the end, we came up with, with 33 species that were, were identified uh, with confidence. And uh, you can see if we look over at the totals column over here that the number of individuals in each of these species uh, varies quite dramatically. So that you know, for the last spring count, uh, you can see that the uh, butterfly that was most abundant that we counted the most of was the California patch butterfly. There were like 400, almost 400 California patch butterflies seen, which is almost a quarter of all of the individuals that we saw. Some of the other really common ones were the sleepy orange up here at 108, uh, the pipevine swallowtail uh, at 260 individuals was, uh, was also quite abundant. And as you look over these data, you can see there are quite a few uh, species like the Ceramus blue, the great purple hair streak, the desert orange tip that were only a few, very few individuals seen. And this is typical for most of our counts that we'll have anywhere from five to 10 species that are quite abundant, represent a large number of the individuals seen on the count, and a, but then a, a, a even larger number of species where we only saw just one, two, three, four, five. And there are various reasons for that. We won't go into all of that today, but uh, we there are various reasons we think that happens, but uh, won't go into all that today, but these are what the count data look like. You can see that across the sites, some of them uh, are, we, we saw more individuals than others. To, you know, it looks like each of the sites, even this spring was recording somewhere between 100, 200 individual butterflies. The 128th Street tank, the smaller number of individuals, but it's a much smaller site overall. So these are some of the things that, uh, that we take into consideration as we look over these data. But this is what the count data look like. Uh, just to give you a sense of the beauty of the animals that we're tracking down, here are some of the species that are really common. The pipevine swallow tail up here is a, a perennial favorite. People love to see it. They're really big, have this blue black coloration that's greatly enhanced by this iridescent blue. The Pima desert orange chip is one that was fairly is sometimes pretty abundant. Well, I put this here um, because it's one that only occurs in the spring counts. As Doug suggests, we do counts in the spring and the fall. And this is one that we only see in the spring. So, and there are a number of other species that are seasonal like this. Here's the California patch that was so abundant this spring and continues to be abundant in the desert now. Uh, this uh, sleepy orange up here is another one that's sometimes extremely abundant. Southern dog face, we saw sort of a surprising number of those this year. Empress Lelia is a wonderful uh, butterfly that perches as part of its mate locating tactic, males occupy and defend perching sites uh, they use to get make contact with females. 
spring azure, another one that tends to be a little seasonal, and then this dusky wing, one belonging to a group of very fast flying uh, butterflies called the skippers. And this is one of the skippers that's typically most abundant during the counts. So we've been doing these counts in the fall now since 2014, and we've added spring counts in 2017. And these graphs give you a sense of how the number of species in the upper graph and in the lower graph, the number of individuals has varied from one count to the next. And the thing that's most striking to me about this as I look at this is just how much variation there is. Um, you can see that uh, that in in the uh, for example, if we look at the number of individuals, the low point was really here in 2000 at the end of a very very dry uh, monsoon year uh, when we saw uh, in the fall count only about 45 individual butterflies. That was seen by all of the teams all together, and in contrast, this last fall after we had quite a good monsoon rainfall, we saw the largest number of individual butterflies we've ever seen on the preserve in one of these counts, almost 10,000 individual butterflies. And they're sort of everywhere, a lot of everywhere in between, you know, here in 2018 and about 1300 individual butterflies. And so this variation is just immense and it doesn't really at this point show any clear downward or upward trend that we can state is happening with confidence. The spring counts shown in blue are similarly variable going from uh, again, relatively high numbers in 2019 when we saw almost 2000, indivi uh, 2000 individual butterflies. Uh, to other years like 2018 when the spring count was very, very low. The number of species is a little less variable, and, but in general, the number of species that we see is a function of the number of individuals we see. And I won't say too much more about that, except that the typical count is somewhere around 20 to 25 species of butterflies. And uh, this is uh, out of now what we've recorded is 79 or 59 species of butterflies on the preserve. Some of this has to do with seasonality. There are other possible reasons for it as well. So in terms of trying to think about the causes of that variation, of course, immediate focus is on, on, on rain. This, the, the rain is also highly variable, like the numbers of butterflies. So that in 2021, when in the fall, when we had uh, absolutely a huge number of butterflies, well, not surprisingly, the summer rain was pretty high that year. Um, but the, you can see how the summer rain varies from year to year. These are for four different sites on the preserve, just showing that there's not a huge difference, huge differences among sites. And then here are the winter range showing how they are also highly variable. And so the interesting question is, well, how do these things, tr do these things help us understand what the numbers, of, the, the numbers of in species and individual butterflies that we see on the counts? Here's for the fall counts. I've got rainfall on the x-axis here, going from zero up to 12 inches and the number of individuals uh, seen on the count during a given year. And so that, for example, this data point right here, about five inches of rain fell that year and that count, we saw about a thousand species of butterflies. And what you can see is that these relationships are not per really linear, they're better described by other sorts of formulae, but uh, the correlation coefficients, if you know anything about those, are quite high, which means that rainfall is a pretty good, appears to be a pretty good indicator of the number, or, or highly correlated with the number of individuals that we see. Similarly, rainfall is, uh, the number of species we see is correlated with the rainfall during, on a fount, uh, during the summer. This is for fall counts again. What about spring counts? Well, I'm, these are the data. Uh, I'm going to show you these data first. Here uh, we've done spring six spring counts now, and uh, what you can see is that there's again a. If we looked at the five years before this last spring, 
uh, before the count done this spring, we could see there's a pretty strong correlation between the number of species we see and the number and the amount of winter rain. This is going from 2017 to 2021. Similarly, the number of individuals goes up uh, in a very nice way with uh, winter rain went up in a, this way uh, over the first five years of the spring count. So what I did as an exercise was I estimated using this equation, which seems to seem to fit the relate data pretty well, to estimate the number of species we would see. And we, the, the estimate was that for the spring 2022 count, we would see 18.4 uh, species and somewhere between 18, 19 species. And uh, for the, these, these same counts, the estimate was we would see about 186 individuals. This was because the rainfall going from October, last October to March was only about 6.5 inches. So you can see that would put it right about here, estimating about 18 species. Well, here's what actually happened. The estimated 18.4 species, when we went actually out and did the count, we got 33 species. And the estimate for the number of individuals was 186 individuals and the actual count produced all, over 1300 individual butterflies. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't get laughed out of the building. <laughs> but the, uh, the point is that uh, there are some things we obviously still do not understand about uh, about what is determining the number of species and the number of individuals we see in these counts. And uh, it could be that it has to do with the pattern of rain. We, um, we had 6.5 inches, but a lot of it was in the period before the first of the year with essentially nothing afterwards. And maybe that early season rain is enough to really drive this. And hopefully over the years, as we get more data, of these sort, we'll, we'll get a better handle on this, what determines these uh, pop, the, the number of species and individuals that we see. If I add in the, the, the 2022 data, I still get positive correlations uh, with winter rain between the number of species and the number of individuals. As you can see, this is for all six years of the counts uh, now. And the correlation coefficients are, are good, but they are not as strong as they were before I added in uh, this year's data. So it just suggests we still have some things to learn. So my take home lessons are, our take home lessons at this point are 59 species have been preserved on, this, on the preserve. There's something like 125 species for all of Maricopa County. So we don't have all the species on the preserve that occur but new species are still being added. This spring, we added the golden-headed scallop wing, which hadn't been reported on the preserve before. As I said, some species are very common, uh, dozens or hundreds seen on one count, but for, the most, for most species, we see only a few individuals. Um, again, one could talk about why that is. Won't take the time to do that today. Season to season variation in the number of species and number of individuals is huge, but no clear trend at this point. See so year to year variation, the number of species and individuals counted is huge. There's no clear trend. Uh, again, variation is correlated with rainfall in months preceding count, but there's a lot to learn. And there is a more complicated analysis of the data that we've been collecting on the preserve. It's being spearheaded by uh, Helen Rowe. Uh, I'm involved with that. Some other people are involved. We're looking not only at the count preserve data, the preserve data, but also at the um, at regional data, data collected in uh, counts in Southern Arizona and trying to make sense of, uh, get a better feel for how rainfall affects uh, butterfly populations in this region. And again, our counts make an important contribution to documenting changes over time in species abundance and diversity that will ultimately lead to scientific analyses like those reported in that science paper that I illustrated earlier. So uh, thanks again to, to all of the people who contribute to these counts. It's a, it's a really fun activity and producing a lot of really interesting results. So at that point, I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, that's, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Ron and Doug. 
Um, if you want to take down your presentation, you can. Yeah. Uh, we're running over time, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. And if others have more questions, feel free to email them to me at stewardevents at mcdowelsonorn.org, um, and I'll pass them along to our appropriate experts. So Robin, who has been trained and been involved in other counts and obviously loved it, wants to know, does she need to go for training again if she wants to participate in next season's count? Uh, hang on just a second. Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out or, or getting my... Uh... To stop screen sharing? That's all right. Don't worry yeah. about that. Okay. That's okay. Um, okay. Sometimes the count proceed. Oh, there. Oh, I guess I did. Uh, yeah, yeah my, my technological expert over here did it. Okay, thanks. Uh, sometimes the count procedures do change a little bit. Okay. Um, so it's, it's helpful if people do attend the, uh, the, um, the training, I think anyway, every, every, every time we do a count. Uh, we also often review identification issues and some other things that uh, sometimes change a little bit from one training session to the next. Doug, what would you say? I would agree with that. And our protocol is evolving over time. So I think it's a good idea for people to attend on a, fair, on a regular basis. Oh, great. All right. Well, hopefully there'll be many uh, as you prepare for next season. So somebody wants to know, what is the average speed of a butterfly? Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I would say that the average speed, geez, I, having worked in science for so many years, I think of it as being about three or four, uh, three or four meters per second. Okay. I, I'm not sure quite what that works out. I guess that would be, uh, you know, um, what, 12, 10 or 12 feet per second. They can move really fast. Okay. But, uh, but I, I think it's generally recognized that larger butterflies fly faster. Okay. But yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I, there's not a real, it's hard when there are 20,000 species of butterflies, it's right, hard right. to make generalizations like right, that. Right, right. Um, what is the average lifespan of a butterfly? Well, uh, the adults, uh, on average, I think what you'll hear people say is they only live on the order of two to three weeks. Oh. But the total lifespan, remember from that previous slide, it starts with the egg. Right. and goes to the end of the adult stage. And for quite a few of the butterflies on the preserve, like those orange tips, um, the, uh, that, period, that can be a, a, a full year. Wow. A okay. full year. Uh, other species, it's, it's less. It might be a matter of three or four months. Put that and Jesse back on. That's great. Thank you so much. This has been fabulous. And again, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. So if you have more questions, feel free to email them to me at stewardevents at mcdowellsnorn.org and I will get them to the appropriate speaker. In the meantime, Debbie, Doug, Ron, Jesse, bravo. Thank you so much. We all learned a lot and appreciate all the time and expertise you so generally share with all of us. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Hope to see you May 12th when we talk about our other winged friends, the birds. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.